Hello and welcome to the RCSI My Health Lecture Series. My name is Professor Steve Kerrigan and today we are going to discuss LGBTI plus health, transgender healthcare. The My Health Lecture Series explores a wide range of areas in health and well-being and brings together some of the leading healthcare experts in these fields with the goal of empowering people with the knowledge to make informed decisions about their own health and well-being. Today I'm joined by Dr. Seamus Duffy, GP and Clinical Lecturer at the Department of General Practice in RCSI, Dr. Caroline Kelleher, Lecturer at the Department of Health Psychology Division of Population Health in RCSI, Dr. Vanessa Lacey, Health and Education Manager at Transgender Equality Network Ireland, and Dr. Carl Neff, Consultant Endocrinologist and HSE Clinical Lead for the National Gender Service at St. Column Kills Hospital in Dublin to discuss this topic in more detail. Seamus, I might come to you first. What is the role of primary care in transgender health? Uh, thank you, Steve, and thank you for inviting me to take part in this discussion this evening. Um, I think the role of, of GP in transgender health is, is pivotal. I think we're often the first point of contact uh, for patients. Uh, and as such, uh, we provide continuity of care to them. And de depending on what stage of the journey the patients are on, we can be with them for the entirety of that journey. Now, as we know, uh, patients from the transgender community experience you know, social exclusion, uh, discrimination and harassment, for example. So providing a safe space for them to uh, be able to disclose uh, their gender identity and uh, look after their general health needs is very important. That's very useful, Seamus, thanks. However, not everything is about gender. Do GPs provide general medical care or sexual health services to transgender individuals? Uh, yes, yeah, Steve, we, we do. And that's a, a message that's often lost. I mean, GPs are there for a holistic approach to every patient, including general health, sexual health. And uh, there is a, a term diagnostic overshadowing. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, which suggests that oftentimes uh, healthcare providers can get uh, distracted by the sort of diagnosis or the mental health issue, which is underlying the patient's presentation and sometimes miss uh, the other issues that, are, that they're presenting with. And, you know, um, all patients ha have, have lots of issues that need uh, general medical care, like lifestyle factors, preventative health, and in the context of sexual health, and I think we may touch on this later, uh, there is a distinction between um, sexual identity and gender identity, so, or sexual orientation rather. So therefore, sexual health services do need to be provided uh, to this population as well. And that requires sensitivity and a knowledge of where the patient is on their journey in order to adequately provide that. Okay, thanks for that, Seamus. Uh, Vanessa, some transgender people may not consult uh, healthcare services because they've had a, a negative experience with doctors in the past. What tools have been used to educate healthcare providers on the transgender community? Yeah, I suppose with ourselves in, in Tenney, we would have an approach that, um, and we're supported to do that through the um, Social Inclusion Division in the HSC, we're funded to do that. So we provide uh, different levels of training, and that's a key aspect for us. Uh, at the moment, we're in the process of developing a HSC land training, so foundation training that lasts over a half an hour. So we already have our full days training, which is the transgender awareness training, uh, which at the moment is cut down into two half days due to COVID. So we adapted our trainings. We adapted all our work, Steve, to be able to, to meet the needs of the healthcare professionals and our community during this very sensitive time. And also we have developed uh, a quite extensive three-day training called gender identity skills training. So I suppose the three packages of training, uh, what we're coming through is absolutely the evidence base that, that's out there. Um, everything is based in research, so we would uh, deliver uh, the factual information to the healthcare providers. Uh, we would give that through a, a lived experience lens, so we would bring them statistics to life. Sometimes when we're looking continuously at statistics, they can kind of blindside us a little bit. So I think really to bring them to life, to let them know in terms of the wealth of experience that we have and working with our, with our community and working with our families. Uh, that these are the experiences and, and these are the instances 
that are leading into uh, those statistics and doing it in, in a really uh, open way uh, where, where healthcare professionals can absolutely speak about their experience as well. So yeah, very much in a non-judgmental way, Steve, I think that's always our approach to, uh, to deliver training. Yeah, that sounds very important. Um, Seamus, from a GP perspective, how can GPs help reduce negative encounters with medical practitioners? I, I think this is uh, something that we are striving to do and providing supports in order to do that. I mean, providing a, an inclusive practice, uh, maybe putting up some posters, outlining the inclusivity for all groups, uh, making sure that staff uh, are aware and that uh, they also know how to address um, members of the transgender community. And I guess from our perspective, it's around, um, you know, having a, a frank and open discussion uh, with the patient and, and finding out uh, how they wish to be addressed. Do they have a particular name? Do they want to use a particular pronoun? And, uh, you know, being familiar uh, with the terminology involved and uh, the issues. And then also knowing what referral pathways are out there so that you can provide some guidance on that and what supports are there from a mental health perspective or whatever other issues are arising. Yeah, that all seems very uh, positive. Caroline, I might come to you next. What are the barriers to accessing appropriate healthcare in the transgender community? Unfortunately, um, transgender individuals um, being a vulnerable part of our population often experience um, a lot of negative negativity in the society. Um, and that in itself can be difficult to try to access any kind. So if there's stigma, if there's um, harassment, if there's anything like that, it's going to make it a lot harder for somebody to actually reach out for some help. And um, there can be negative experiences um, when they contact health services. We certainly have data that shows that transgender individuals um, are sometimes received very poorly. And sometimes they're prevented from having treatment um, because of their gender status. And as well as that, because they um, have um, can be more vulnerable, more exposed to things like depression, um, maybe have some more um, issues around alcohol, drug abuse, all of that. That makes it very, very hard for them to reach out and get some kind of help. Um, so it's kind of compounding a problem that that really um, could easily be prevented by kind of support and humanity shown by by the people around them. That's very insightful. Thanks, Caroline. Um, I'd like to move over to Carl now. Carl, you are the HSE clinical lead of the National Gender Service. What is this service? And what is the referral pathway for someone who wants to attend the National Gender Service? Yeah, the National Gender Service has actually been present in some form in St. Colm Kills Hospital for about 20 years. Uh, previously, it had been a very a medical based service. So it was endocrinology and surgery centered. So it was where people went to access gender affirming hormone therapy or be referred on for gender affirming surgery. And that was the case really until 2018 when we changed the way we do things. The reason we changed the way we do things is that by focusing only on the medical and surgical aspects of a person's transition, we neglected lots of other aspects unintentionally. And through experience and, and over time, we realized that that resulted in very serious harm um, that could potentially have been prevented if we had known the person better and if we were able to identify and address their needs prior to hormones or surgery. So what we now do is we start with a comprehensive multidisciplinary assessment. So now the National Gender Service is not just endocrinologists and psychiatrists, it's a whole range of disciplines, including occupational therapists, social workers, speech and language therapists, nursing of different disciplines, as well as endocrinology and psychiatry and psychology. Um, and that gives us the ability with a multidisciplinary approach to really complete a comprehensive multidisciplinary assessment, identify any needs the person may have and address them prior to any, any hormone or surgical intervention. Um, so it is much more complicated than people uh, realize. And it's surprising to most people that visit us, be they trainees, RCSI students as we have at the moment, um, or anybody that it's not what they thought it would be. They thought it was gonna be a very like, here's a prescription off you go type service. It's much more complicated than that. Um, but thankfully the referral pathway, so the referral pathway is very simply a single referral letter directly to the National Gender Service to me or any of my cons consultant colleagues. Um, you do not need to get a diagnosis of gender dysphoria to be referred to us. It's just one letter, that's it. And that's as simple as the referral pathways. 
Okay, and why do people need to attend for assessment prior to starting hormones or having surgery? Because hormones and surgery are really important parts of many people's transition. Now, remembering, and this is a very common misconception, that being trans and undergoing medical transition, be it with hormones or surgery, are very separate things. So many trans people never want to or never access hormones and never have any kind of surgery. Um, so people often conflate those two things. When it comes specifically to a medical or surgical intervention, there are ben many benefits, but there are many risks. And those risks are not usually the physical health risks that people imagine. So certainly there are physical health risks associated with hormone interventions and surgical interventions, but the much more commonly encountered risks are risks to social health, which can include complete loss of close relationships like the relationship with your spouse, with your children, with your parents, um, complete social isolation, homelessness, loss of income because people feel unable to continue working or to continue with education, as well as that there's mental health complications that people don't expect. And there may complex reasons for that. So Pete, the common narrative that's understood is that hormone and surgery will almost universally improve mental health. And for most people, it does when it's done correctly. Um, but if done without proper support and without proper assessment, it can actually result in a serious deterioration and decline in people's mental health. And as well as that, there's functional health. So increasingly we're seeing more and more, especially with people who may have functional impairments prior to coming to see us, those functional impairments can get worse. And those are impairments in anything from attending education, uh, engaging in the workplace, or simply leaving the house, very simple day-to-day -day tasks. It can become much more difficult to do that if there are needs that are not addressed prior to hormones and surgery. Hormones and surgery make life much more complicated, can make life much more stressful. So it's important to understand where this person is at and what, what supports they do need before prescribing hormones or referring on for surgery. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, um, why do people who have a diagnosis of gender dysphoria from elsewhere need to attend for this assessment? So as I said, the gender dysphoria element is a very important element for some people, although it should be noted that increasingly in our current um, uh, population attending the, the service, gender dysphoria is not as, um, as dominant a feature of their presentation as it may have been in the past. So many people now presenting have minimal dysphoria sometimes. Uh, so dysphoria is not usually the, the central part of this person's uh, need. Their, other, their main need is just really affirming their gender rather than treating gender dysphoria. So the gender dysphoria bit is very important if present, um, but there are many other very important bits. So it's not just about gender dysphoria, it's about the whole person, their world, the world they live in, how they're able to function in their world, um, and not just about gender dysphoria. Okay, and what is this uh, initial assessment? So how is it structured and, and, and what's the purpose of this assessment? So the initial assessment, as I said, purpose-wise is really, there's two very broad purposes. One is to, and the main one is to establish uh, this person's needs. So it's an assessment of need, essentially, where we go through a number of domains. Uh, and when people come to see us practically, the experience is a life story type narrative and history approach where we start off with literally, where were you born? And we go from there and we see where that story takes us. And when we go through that story, we're going through a number of different um, themes. Uh, one of them is how this person has been able to engage in the social world. So from school age all the way through to now, how have they been able to engage with other people? What are their family relationships like? Um, what are their uh, you know, platonic relationships like, romantic relationships, and how are they able to engage in the world outside of those kind of more personal relationships? Uh, we also look at how they're able to function. So were they able to participate in education? Were they able to engage uh, in work, in the world of work? Uh, are there things that they feel that they're not physically able to do, uh, such as, as I said, it can be as, as basic as leaving the house unaccompanied. Sometimes that is very difficult for people. And as well as that, we look at their health needs. So mainly mental health, because that's the most commonly encountered issue that people have, but also physical health um, needs as well. So that entire story and narrative approach really covers everything um, from, as I said, your day-to-day your -day emotional life, your sexual life, your mental health, your social relationships. And the purpose of that is really to find out is there anything that as you move forward with the medical transition could put you in harm's way? Or is there anything that you are not aware of that 
could be changed. So commonly sexual health is the one that this is uh, encountered in sex steroids like estrogen and testosterone. Their primary function is to regulate sexual activity and reproduction, but many people don't anticipate a lot of the changes that come with that. So the purpose is to understand where this person's at and what their needs are and to then support those needs. The other part of the assessment very broadly is to understand what this person's goals are. So this is where we talk about the person's gender development. We understand how their gender development has occurred over time. For some people, it's a life course thing where from the earliest memory until now, they've understood that they are trans. For other people, there was a specific moment in time in adolescence or adulthood where this happens. Uh, and that assessment is really to understand where, what this person's gender uh, is from their perspective and how they want to affirm it and what their gender affirming goals are. So what we're looking for is an understanding of, will the inter help this person affirm their gender? And if that's the case, then great. And if not, then we give them that advice. Um, sometimes as well, we need to know that the person's gender is stable because a lot of people are very fluid, which is completely okay. But if you're somebody who's very fluid and you move through masculine and feminine um, times in your life, then sometimes an intervention that would be very affirming at one time in your life may not be affirming at another time. So understanding the person's gender identity in terms of how clear and stable it is, but also in terms of how the intervention will help them affirm that gender is really important to make sure that their um, the goals that they've set themselves are achievable. Thank you for all that very valuable information, Carl. Vanessa, can I ask you, is medicalization or medical intervention always necessary? Yeah, I think kind of Carl uh, answered that question somewhat. I think in uh, previously, um, I, there's 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 some many people who don't actually go under any medical interventions or need medicalization. Uh, they just get on with their life. They make some changes to themselves or change to their um, social structures and and live quite happy. Uh, as Carl said, he talked about gender fluid people, and they can have a fluid presentation. So the research would suggest that not all people would go through medical interventions or would need that. But at the same time, some people do. And some people need them. Um, I feel they need them after coming out at whatever age. Some people come out at, at, at 16 years of age. Some people come out at 60 years of age. And, and at 60 years of age, you don't have an awful lot of time left in the world. Um, often a, a situation can be then, and the evidence would, would suggest this as well, uh, Steve, is that um, very long waiting lists uh, can absolutely lead into me mental health difficulties as well. So it is a major problem when, when there is extended waiting lists for people to access this. As you can Im imagine, as a 60 year old who was just coming out to their family, coming out to their children and coming out to their grandchildren. And, and they need to actually access into a service that can help them, uh, not, not to pathologize them, uh, but to help them and they can feel validated in who they are and they can speak about their story as Carl was saying like you speak about their story um, that they can get it out uh, and feel feel that validation and feel that empowerment where they would have feel that disempowerment and they would have internalized lots of that shame and guilt throughout their life and here is an opportunity for them to live the life that they feel that they they maybe should have le le led before but at the same time, and again, as Carl has mentioned, you know, you have the family aspect in there. And certainly for us as an organization, Steve, we have worked with families since 2011. So uh, 10 years experience working with families. And we understand the nuances here to be able to support the family and support uh, the, the trans person themselves. So no, not all people would need to have medical interventions, but some people do. And the people that do will, will need that service and often that very long waiting list is majorly problematic uh, because not all people then will wait them three years to go see the National Gender Service. Some will go for online services and that can be a, a problem if they're not supported in that way. So at this moment in Ireland, we do have a problem uh, in around access and healthcare and uh, for, for the people that need a medical intervention or feel that they need medical intervention. Great. And, and, and Vanessa, the Irish College of General Practitioners has published the only guide to transgender healthcare inclusivity um, and pathways to national gender service. How can healthcare providers make practice visits more inclusive and more welcoming? 
Yeah, I think, you know, it's always good to have visibility. I, I, I gave um, a couple of talks already today in terms of a rainbow badge that CHI are bringing in. It's, it's wonderful to see uh, this rainbow badge. Uh, I think there was 4,000 people, I think, will will see that video that we, we made earlier on. And also in HSC Southeast, they develop a rainbow eye. So there's lots of rainbows going on, Steve, especially for we're in the moment of pride. So I think that visibility is really key. And to have that in um, GP surgeries and uh, other healthcare uh, professionals' uh, surgeries as well, just to have that visibility, to feel that this is a safe space. I might be able to come out here. I might be able to, not all people would say, I want you to use this pronoun. I want you to use this name. Or if a GP would say, do you want me to use a different pronoun? Sometimes they shut down, you know, so it's not as simplistic as that. So I think between that, and I think really what, what, what I would urge, I suppose, is, is health professionals in this area. I mean, this is a very short 35 minute presentation and, and it's wonderful to have it, you know, but if you want to connect in with us and we'd be delighted to maybe signpost you to a training that meets your needs. So I think in terms of the visibility and in terms of the information. Great, they're really important points. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, Caroline, I'm gonna to come to you next. Creating a, a transgender affirming workplace and society is critical. Um, can you maybe explain the important role of our transgender ally? Yeah, absolutely, Steve. So a, a transgender ally is somebody who advocates and respects the LGBT community and, and, is, and is vocal and active in their response to that. So it's usually a cisgender, and what I mean by that is, is somebody whose gender identity aligns with the gender that was assigned to them at birth. Um, so me, for example, I would identify as a cisgender woman. Um, and it's an ally is somebody who, who can advocate for that community. And they can do that in a number of ways. The first way is to educate yourself. So the good news is you've already started to do that. You've come and watched this video, which is really good. So you're starting to get some information. And now you can use that information to challenge transphobia. And that's another important thing that, that we would encourage people to do, not in a way that puts you in any danger, but, you know, talking about these having these conversations with people that you know and um, talking about misconceptions maybe people have different ideas of what transgender is and after watching this you can inform them about that the third thing would be to listen listen to the community and um, hear their voices understand what their needs are and i would say fourthly um, respect that's a really important thing respect for people's boundaries and, and that's a kind of basic human right it's not something that's particular for the trans community um, but, you know, me personally, I don't I, I don't appreciate somebody, you know, randomly coming up to me and asking me questions about my personal life or my anatomy or anything like that. Um, and transgender in exactly the same way, you know, do not need or require to answer those questions either. And um, so I think if, if you, we can practice that kind of thing, we really have a role in, in changing the kind of social norms that support these kind of inappropriate behaviors. Years. And the reality is this is not a transgender problem. This is not a, a problem that the LGBT community have to um, deal with. This is something that's a problem for all of us. And the, the best part about that is we can become allies and we can um, help um, change that kind of society and advocate for, for people that deserve the same kind of respect that any, anybody else does. That's great. Thank you, Caroline. Before we close today's discussion, could I ask each of you, what would your key takeaway message be for the viewers watching this? Seamus, I might come to you first. Sure, thanks, Steve. What I would say is that uh, GP is open and we're aiming to ensure that all GPs have the knowledge and skill set to ensure a positive uh, experience for members of the transgender community when they engage with primary care, whether that's around their general health mental health, sexual health, or indeed issues around transgender health itself. That's great. Thank you, Seamus. Vanessa, what's your take home message? I suppose my take home message, I suppose, would be that it's not miserable being trans. You know, sometimes you can get the impression that it's uh, everything is looked through a negative lens in terms of trans people and our families. Um, trans people go on to have very po uh, positive lives. Uh, trans people are politicians. Trans people are are doctors, trans people are clinicians, uh, trans people are in all areas of, of, of life um, and Irish life. And, you know, sometimes uh, I suppose it, there's not a need to be uh, assessed to an inch of your life. Uh, I think to, to be able to enjoy your life, 
you know i mean we're human beings uh, just like everybody else uh, we go on to have fulfilled lives I, i'm very conscious that people who might be watching uh, did this this wonderful program um, whether they're whether they're family members or whether they're transgender people themselves i suppose what i the message i would like to give them is, is to absolutely be your authentic self and, and seek that support and seek that affirmation and speak uh, seek that validation you know and you know for 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 and from an irish perspective uh, you know i would like to see certainly the services delivered to transgender people uh, to be much more trans sensitive and, and trans inclusive uh, to be the services that we deserve that are in line with international best practice uh, and really that's the message that i want to get through today is that it is okay and it's wonderful to be to be trans and we absolutely have fulfilled lives and uh, i really appreciate an opportunity to come on this program with such under uh, wonderful speakers and um if anybody needs any help, please contact us in, in Tenny, and we'd be delighted to support you at www.tenny.ie. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Vanessa. Caroline, what is your take-home message? I think the most important message that I would like people to take away from today is, is to find their voice as an ally for the transgender community. You know, a lot of the time people maybe lack the confidence and are afraid of causing upset or afraid of making a mistake. And I'd like to think that, that the education they've had here today will help them find their voice to do that. And I think if they do, they will find that there are a lot of other voices around them that are more than willing to amplify what they're saying. Thank you, Caroline. And Carl, what's your take home message? My take home message would be to anybody who is worried about trans healthcare, has questions about trans healthcare, uh, that they can talk to us. Trans healthcare is complicated. The pathways can seem very confusing, but we are more than happy to talk to clinicians, service users, or potential service users uh, and answer your questions. So please don't be afraid to contact us. You can email us, uh, phone us, and our website will be uh, live in the coming weeks. We hope it's been a bit delayed because of the cyber attack, and we'll have all of those resources available on the link uh, attached to this um, seminar. So that concludes our discussion today. My thanks to our speakers, Dr. Seamus Duffy, Dr. Caroline Kelleher, Dr. Vanessa Lacey, and Dr. Carl Nerf. Links to any of the additional resources mentioned in today's discussion will be shared on the RCSI website. This is also the final lecture in the current My Health Lecture series, but we will be back in September with another series for you to enjoy. My thanks to all of you, our viewers, for your engagement with this year's virtual RCSI My Health series. We hope you have found the topics and discussions of interest and that you've learned and discovered useful tools and techniques to help support and enhance your own health and well-being. Please visit the RCSI website for further information on previous and future My Health series events. From all of us here at RCSI University of Medicine and Health Sciences, thank you for watching. Take care and stay safe.